It's your name we pray. Amen. Hey, good morning, everybody. How we doing? All right. Hey, I love that. Hey, my name is Chris Pleckenpole, which is a mouthful if you're new. And I'm so glad that you're here. And uh, I'm the lead pastor here at Wells Branch Community Church. And if you're watching online, welcome. And one of the things we love to do is answer questions or take on your snarky comments. Either one is great. Uh, and because if you don't really text anything in, I have nothing really to talk about all week long uh, for our post-sermon podcast, which is really more like a post-sermon social media vlog, but that's okay. Uh, and I would love to answer all those, and we've had some really great uh, questions come in, so I'd love to do more of that and interact with you uh, via social media. So please text in. I won't think you're doing anything other than that or reading your Bible and being very spiritual. So I'm um, grateful for that. So pull out your phones and do that. Um, so we've been in a series called Freedom. And we basically have been going over the gospel, uh, and if you've, if you've been around Christians for a while, uh, gospel is Christianese for how you're saved, okay? If you didn't know that, that's just another way of saying it. Uh, and we've got shirts that sort of explain this with really great characters. So uh, the good news, the gospel, is that he came, he died, he rose, he ascended, he's coming back. So that's the gospel, and that's pretty much um, all you need to know about Christianity, in fact, uh, everything beyond that is just going deeper into that knowledge, and so it's, it's simple for a child to access it, but it's uh, even PhD scholars that are nerdy people that all they do is study, they don't even, they can't even get to bore to the very depths of it. So that's so great. And one of the things I wanted to get into on our, I guess this is the fifth week of going over the gospel, we're in the book of Galatians, is really explaining uh, that Christianity, when we talk about the gospel of he came, he died, he rose, he sent, he's coming back, is different uh, from every other religion because every other religion has some form of believing something, but then on top of that, there is a doing component, okay, that is how you're saved. And I really realized this when I was uh, in Iraq. I, for some of you guys know I was a soldier, uh, did time in Iraq, and I was a war person. And so one of the things we would do is we, you know, we'd sneak into informants' houses, which is about the coolest thing, coolest job you could ever get. You climb through mud and then you, you sneak up and then you get into their house and they're not really too excited about the mud you brought in, but they're excited that you're there to talk to them. And one of the funny things is, is like, you know, in, in Middle, Middle Eastern culture, uh, men kiss each other. And so that's awkward enough for Americans who don't kiss no man. Right? So uh, I, I, I you, you, so you're like, how do we, how do we do this? And I've got like a big helmet with a, my night vision goggles that, you know, kind of come down. And so what it happens, like, wham, I like, like headbutt the guy and they're like, ah, and so that'd be hard enough as it was. So I'd have to recover from that. And we'd have like small talk where we'd recover from that uh, to before I got to where they're telling me all the bad guys were. And uh, eventually what came up was the subject of my faith. And they just assumed that all Americans were Christians. And it just so happened on that one that they were right, right? It was just like, and, and you're right. Look, look, sure enough. But the problem was, this is what they would say. It's like, um, you don't uh, drink and you don't have, well, at least I didn't then. I didn't start drinking until I became a pastor. That's another story. Okay. So, um, <laughs> Uh, you don't drink and you don't, uh, you know, have sex outside of marriage. Uh, you are a really good person. God is very happy with you. That was sort of like the, the whole context. And what they were doing is they're reading into Christianity what they understood of Islam. That was just sort of like, so what you do is you believe stuff, do things, God accepts you. And so it's based upon not necessarily the belief aspect, but your performance, right? Performance. And I think that what happens is it's not just people in Islam, it's people in America, right? We do this too. We do this. We say, um, we say, yeah, I just believe in Jesus, but the way we live our life is I have to perform to be accepted. Because every aspect of our lives is you perform and are accepted. This is why you have uh, evaluation reports or performance evaluation reports or performance improvement plans because uh, to accept you at this role, we need to improve your performance. Do you see that? 
You see that? And so what happens, naturally, that, of course, is going to bleed over into our faith because why wouldn't it? Everything bleeds into our faith. And so what happens is we become people so focused on performance that all of a sudden it's, I, yes, I believe in Jesus, but don't you understand? I've got to do something. And then what happens, I, in fact, uh, last service, I got texted this in the middle of it. it was, uh, this is why we get so excited about Bible streaks, right? Like, you guys know I'm talking about version Bible streaks? Uh, James sent me this. He's like, knocked out 136 days in a row. That's right. Uh, and so what can happen is you sort of base how you're doing with God based upon how many quiet times in a row you've knocked out on you version, which like is, as everyone knows, those are really some deep devotionals that we're really digging into. All right, so depending on which one you get. So what can happen, what can happen is we sort of assume, and we were like, I'm good spiritually. I'm you version 136, baby. I'm going all the way back into 2019. Like who can even do that? And so what can happen is you assume you're all right with God because you're doing something on your phone. Okay? And you focused on your performance, and as long, and, but the problem is you're only as good as your last knocked out quiet time. And that's exhausting. That's exhausting. Because if you don't keep it up, what then? What happens when the streak is broken? You fell off the wagon, and, it, and this is what you do. It's kind of like uh, you're on a diet plan, and then you miss a day. You're like, nah, don't worry about a tub of ice cream. You know, that, that's how we go, right? But we just like, nah, don't worry. That, that's what happens. And so this can happen in your spiritual life. You're doing great for 136 days, and then like one day you don't make it, and you can't put on a little check on your Bible app, and next thing you know, you're like, I don't even want to go to church anymore. Like, you just, you're done. Okay, and then, uh, so that's sort of like, we practice a religion, but it's not Christianity when we focus on our performance, okay? And then on the flip side, on the flip side, when we focus, we're, we're practicing a religion that's not, but a religion, but it's not Christianity when we focus on our shame, okay? So what can happen is we go, listen, um, I did fall off the wagon. I'm such an awful person. I don't think I can make it. I'm a mess. And then here's how we try and fix it for another person. You're not that bad, come on, you have some self-worth, like we got to get that self-esteem up. And here's the problem. That's just not true. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh, now I'm like, whoa, it's American culture right there. Self-esteem, baby. Don't mess with that. Okay, no, no, because what can happen is we've said this. You're not that bad. You've told people, and you had the greatest of intentions. You are not that awfully bad. Buck up, buttercup. It's going to be okay. Silver lining. Draw it in. It's going to be okay. Not only is that not empathetic, it's just not true, okay? You are that bad. And we're going to talk about the reality of how God, watch this, is that good. Because I think that's where we get stuck. We get stuck in our awfulness. And you look around at who you're married to, and you're like, mm-mm, they ain't that good. No, you're right. You're right. Dead on. But the part of the lie that you're believing is that God isn't good enough to even change them. Is that right? We're going to get into that. Okay, and then uh, finally, uh, we focus on our tribe, uh, especially in a polarized world of religion and politics and everything in between. Uh, we sort of decide who's in and who's out. Uh, in fact, our identity of um, even gender, our identity in politics, our identity like whether uh, you're a Trump fan or a Bernie fan, like you, like it's like die hard. They're like, eh, they're all right. No, it's like you're kind of crazy either way. And so what happens is that we can kind of find ourselves in a camp that isn't Jesus's camp, and our focus is on a tribe as opposed to Christ. All right, so that's where we're going this morning, and I'm I'm pumped about it because we're in Galatians. And if you don't have a Bible, look somewhere around you. And, if, and Sanj, I know you're on the front row, but there's nowhere to look around. Uh, you'll have to like, go to another row, but you can stare right there or just like pull out your phone. All right, so uh, we're going to be in Galatians, which is on page 973 of the Bibles you have somewhere in front of you or somewhere around you. And we're going to be going through uh, this book. And we're going to be in this really esoteric part, which is uh, just a fun word to be like really tough to understand. And my job today, this is where I went to seminary to make really challenging things accessible. And so um, you can grade me and then like uh, text in our comments if you understand or not, because it's pretty complicated stuff and I'm going to try and make it uh, accessible. But you guys are super smart, so I kind of have really great faith in you. But remember, the reason why we're getting into this is Paul is writing to respond to the charge uh, that he is a false teacher and he's promoting circumcision 
you know, amongst Jewish Christians, and he's not requiring of the Gentiles, leaving them under a curse of disobedience. He's like, who are you, Paul? Why, will the real Paul step forward? And this entire letter is a response to that. In chapter one, he sort of defends his uh, apostleship, and then he ch charges the Galatians of heresy, which you're like, oh, come on, Chris, heresy? I mean, does, does it matter what anyone really believes? Yes, it does. And here's how we know. When someone gets sad, you challenge what they believe, right? You would say, like, don't, don't go back out with him, right? No, you've said this. Come on, come on, ladies. Don't go back out with him. If you, it's going to be ruined. You can find better, right? You've challenged somebody with an absolute truth that that guy's not worth it. Am I right? Okay, we've got a lot of, okay. yes, yes. Okay, so, so when, I, when we talk about heresy, what you believe matters because it affects what you feel and what you do. So Paul's saying you've got it wrong and you are starting to focus on performance or your shame or your tribe more than Christ, okay? Then chapter two, uh, Paul is gonna show that he has an agreement on salvation by faith with other apostles, like other, you know, like Peter. In fact, he'd even challenge Peter like, Peter, you're not, not living in line with the gospel. And he rebuked him openly. And then uh, chapter three, we talked about this thing of being saved by grace through faith, not the law. And then this week, you guys ready for this week? We're gonna talk about the purpose of the Mosaic law and the Abrahamic promise to which if you're new to church, you're like, that sounds like really complicado stuff. Listen, it's, it is complicated, but you are super smart people, and, and I'm here to walk us through it, and I'm really excited about it. And this, this to me is, um, there's some sweet gems of truth in here that if you sort of understand where Paul is coming from, you're going to go, whoa, okay? I'm, I'm really expecting that to happen. All right, so we're going to pray, and we're going to ask God to open up his word for us, and that our hearts, our minds will be like, like totally in tune with the Holy Spirit. Would you guys pray with me? Father, thank you for your word. I am so grateful that um, I get to sit uh, in your word. I get to study your word. I get to know your word. I get to experience your word. And your word is so, so transformative. It doesn't return void. It's so powerful. I, I just, I want to experience more and more and more of your word. God, would you work in and through me? Would I be able to communicate this truth in a way that anybody can understand. And I pray, God, that I would hear it. And I'd be sitting on the front row uh, hearing you speak. Holy Spirit, would you change me? Would you speak through me and hide me behind the cross as we encounter your word and power? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so remember last week, uh, Joseph preached. How many love Joseph preaching? Come on now. Yeah, wasn't he awesome? Yeah. He is amazing. And so uh, what he talked about was uh, this, this reality that we are saved by grace through faith, not the law. He hammered that point home. And so that's where like verse nine leaves off with that. And so we start on verse 10. Remember, saved by grace through faith, not the law. And then he's gonna talk about the law or works. Watch. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, curse be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now, he's quoting from Deuteronomy 27.6. And so if you're, if you're a big fan of Deuteronomy, and like, it's like your quiet time favorite, uh, you'll see in Deuteronomy 27, it's like, curse be this guy, curse be that guy, curse be... I mean, it's like a list of like 13 curses. And you're just like, man, this is a little cursed. Everybody's cursed. And then the last one's like, curse be everyone. Like, it's like, curse be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. And you're like, man, that's brutal. Okay, now watch. He's going to say... Uh, that's for the people who, who live by the law. Now it's evident that no one is justified before God by the law. Because then he says, for the righteous shall live by faith. And he's quoting Habakkuk 2.4, which I know everyone has been reading recently and just really just mining the depths of Habakkuk. And you, what we would say is just like, this is an incredible thing. It seems like there's two opposite juxtaposed things kind of crammed together. You're right. Because then he's going to go back. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. In other words, the one who does the law shall live by the law. So how do you have this juxtaposition of um, different Old Testament Bible verses which seem to say different things? And here's what's really cool about Paul. I want you to know, I had to, it's not like I knew that this was Deuteronomy 27.6 and Habakkuk 2.4. I'm just like you, I had to Google it. 
okay? Did you know that Paul did not have Google? He didn't even have a Bible. He had a bunch of scrolls stored in a synagogue somewhere. He's like, hey, pull out a back. I think I got to look this one up. And they didn't have trusty Bible verses in them. It just was a bunch of words in a massive scroll. And so Paul, this is what Paul's so cool about Paul. He is schooling the Galatians because he's got this stuff all in his head because the guy memorized it. He's like, yeah, you know, it's in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, Habakkuk, Leviticus, you know, the basics. And so I think that you've really got to just see the unbelievable amount of brain power that Paul has because this is in a, a letter that's just written to the Galatians to correct them. Now, Watch this. He's going to keep going with this, this theme of the curse of the law. Verse 13. <clears throat> Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. And that's from the, the classic verse of 2 Deuteronomy 21, 23. So again, he's, he's pounding the Old Testament. He's like, listen, I'm not abandoning the Old Testament. I'm not unhitching myself from it. I'm just putting it in the right context for you to understand it. Curses everyone who's hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus, so in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it's been ratified. Okay, watch. So what he's saying here is in this quote or in this highlighted part, he says, "In Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, which was there's this promise that the whole world would be blessed." with God's presence, because we're human beings, not human doings, through Abraham. Okay, you, The whole world's going to be blessed. I need you to hold on to it, and the promised Holy Spirit that would indwell us is coming through him. Okay, Hang on. You're like, okay, help me out, Chris. You're about to lose me. Hang with me. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say into offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring. Who's the offspring? Who is Christ? That is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years after the promise. Promise made, 430 years, law. Does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. And I want you to look at this. He refers to uh, this covenant ratified by God, and it's Genesis 15, 8 through 17. And essentially, in Genesis 15, all, starting in Genesis 12, really, God starts talking to Ab Abram, who become Abraham. And he goes, listen, I'm going to bless you, and you are going to have so many kids, and, so, and the whole world is going to be blessed by you. It's going to be awesome. And, you know, for about 20 years or so, Abram's like, God, I trust you. You're it. And then in Genesis 15, he's now, like, pushing 90, all right? And, he, and God's like, you're going to be, you're going to have so many kids. Look at the stars of this guy. You won't be able to count them just like that. And he's like, um, <clears throat> he's like us. He's no, he's no stranger to uh, being a little bit cynical. It's like, um, God, I know uh, you can do all things and all, and everything is in your hands. However, have you seen Sarah? She ain't getting any younger. <laughs> like, you know, she, start, she already passed the time of mammogram testing. It's like, this is kind of, we're, we're beyond, like, you know, it, we're beyond all that, okay? It's, it's over for her. Fertility doctors are saying it ain't happening. And so um, what happens here? is God says, here's how you're going to know. And he asked Abram to go and get um, a cow, uh, a goat, a ram, a pigeon, and a dove. And automatically, he knows what to do with these. He, like, he cuts them all in half, and there's like a blood flowing all over the place, and he lines them up. And what you would do in that day is you would set up a, a contract. If you're going to, you know, today we have a lot of legal papers and, you know, you say, essentially say, if this doesn't happen, I agree to indemnify you or I agree to pay this amount of uh, money. Uh, you do it for your house. And you, how many guys have filled out something to, for a mortgage? And you're just like, dear Lord, how many? You don't even care anymore. You're like, I'll sign whatever. Just get this over with. And you signed a child away and you didn't even know it. All right. So anyway, uh, <laughs> what happens is, so instead of that, instead of going through a lot of paperwork, they have the, the ceremony and you would walk through it. And what you would say is, so let it be done to me as it was done to these animals, if I do not fulfill my part 
of the covenant or contract, okay? So it's like, till death do us part, legit. Now, what would happen or in those days is if you didn't fulfill it, you'd be killed, like you're saying, kill me now. Now, what God does is unbelievable. He promises this blessing to Abraham that he's going to bless the whole world through his offspring. And then he puts Abram in a trance, sits them there, and then God himself, in, in, through the image of a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch, which was like an ancient Near Eastern picture of God, it just sort of floats through the pieces, saying, so let it be done to me, God. Let my immutability become mutable. Let my unbelievable power that's infinite become finite. If, and I will do whatever it takes to fulfill this covenant, and you, Abram, just sit there and watch. Now, you know how we know that, that he wasn't, nothing was required of uh, Abram? Is we watch Abram make a lot of dumb decisions, which God never, like, doesn't even rebuke him for it. Like, whenever he, like, tries to give his wife away a couple times for uh, harems, God just fixes it by giving like the guy that he gives like to the, the Pharaoh of Egypt and to Abimelech, another rich guy. He, go, he gives them nightmares. Give, give this woman back to Abram. That is my man. And they're like, what'd you do? And then they like, why would you do that to us? And they give him a bunch of money. He's like, hey, it works out every time. I just keep, I give my wife away, I get more money. It works out. And so it happens over and over again. And you would think at some point God would like, you know, Abram, what's wrong with you, buddy? He never, never rebukes him once. In fact, when he, when he takes, hey, like, okay, so he gives his wife away a couple times, and then he takes on another wife. He's like, listen, this ain't happening. I know, we trust God. I trust you, God. I believe you. Um, but maybe what you wanted was to go through Hagar. And he's going to specifically say it was through Sarah. So Hagar is, is the servant. He takes her as a wife. And then Hagar, or his, his wife, Sarah, gets really upset about Hagar because, you know, when you bring another woman into the home, in general, it doesn't go well. And look what happened. It didn't go well. And then he's like... He kind of does what every man does. Just do with whatever you want. Just stop yelling at me. And then off Hagar goes, right? Uh, and you watch him just mistake of after mistake after mistake. But this isn't based on Abraham's gifting or skill or righteousness. It's based on God's promise, okay? This is huge. So what I mean is the law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it is no longer by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. So Christians focus on a promise, not our performance. Um, this, this truth not only affects our salvation of how we come into relationship with God, it also affects how we grow in Christ, all right? So everything is affected by this. When I was, uh, I, I'd say, you know, a new Christian, ex excited for God, on fire for God, I wanted to be different, right? I'm not going to be like all those sinners who just can't focus on Jesus, and as a single person, it's like near impossible, overcome lust, uh, just because it's just reality, all right? And uh, I had by my bed, right? I had by, by my, be my bed this sign that I made. Literally, this is what it said. Everyone else is mediocre. All right? In other words, I have the ability to overcome lust, not like those other weak-minded people. Right? Anybody else ever do this? You're like, those weak-minded, needy, unfunctional human beings who can't do anything. Let me show you how awesome I am. And I'd just look at that every night. I'd be like, don't be like them. You know what they're doing. And I think it came back from um, when I was going to be Michael Jordan when I was eight. And, uh, you know, back in the day, and Larry Bird, I know it's like Larry Bird and Uncle Jordan. Anyway, Larry Bird had this quote, like, whenever I'm not practicing, there's some, I know there's somebody else out there shooting threes in their corner. And I was like, I'm going to be like Michael Jordan, only with the work effort or work tenacity of Larry Bird, so that one day when I make the NBA, I'll dominate all people, right? Um, so that would come into my mind, because everybody else is average. Everyone else is mediocre. Everybody else is not trying hard. Everybody else is giving into sin. Everybody else is, but not me! And here's what would happen. For a while, for like a whole week, I'd feel so good. And then I would be telling other people how to live their life. Listen, what you need to do is you got to remind yourself you're not like a weak, other, like piddling person like the rest of humanity. And then I would shame them. And I'd be like, hmm, maybe one day when you arrive and you can get a Bible streak up to 163 days, that's how you'll be spiritual. And I, it was like almost pharisaical, but it felt so good. Then here's what happened. I, uh, you know, uh, in your 20s, uh, you know, the wind blows and things happen for you. 
And uh, what happened, and all of a sudden I'd feel so dark and so, and I'd be like, I'm not going to go to church. I don't deserve to be anywhere. I'm the worthless person. And all the people I've been telling, I was like, ah, don't worry. It's just all, you just can't. And then or I'd lie. And so you have to create an image. That's what happens when it's about your performance. Because you can perform until you don't. You're only as good as your last game. You're only as good as your last night of freedom. And that's where we break down. Uh, and I wanted to show you this in kind of in terms of um, how God laid this out because I feel like, you know, no, Chris, don't you understand the law? The law, remember, the, the law's not there for no reason. I love this that Paul doesn't just disconnect the law. He said, no, the law is important. Let me show you how. So, God, right? Remember, God. Uh, I was going to draw this on a whiteboard, then I was like, wait, this probably will go a lot faster if I just put it on the screen. All right, so here it is. God, he gives a promise, right, to Abraham. He's like, listen, I'm going to bless you. Your offspring is going to be a blessing to the whole world. And it's going to go through Isaac. And then from Isaac, it's going to go to Jacob, not Esau. Okay, not anybody. Else. It's going to go Isaac, and it's going to be Jacob. JK, Jacob is AKA Israel. Good. You guys are all been paying attention. So Jacob is also known as Israel. And from him come the 12 tribes of Israel. But remember, through Jacob comes the promise or offspring of Jesus. Now, 430 years after this initial promise, this whole covenant ratifying thing goes with Abraham, he then gives the law to Moses. You guys remember this? Moses then sits all of Israel down. Let me break it down for you. 613 uh, ways to please God. And if you don't, you're cursed. Okay? So then through Moses, then Israel, and then remember, Jesus happens to come through the tribe of Judah, which is, you know, from Israel, and here comes Jesus. Now, what Jesus does is he fulfills the law. He completes it. Done. And then, and then, remember, if we believe in him, we get to come into relationship. We get the promised Holy Spirit. We receive the, Holy, the promised Holy Spirit through faith, not because of our works, because of faith. And so it, does, it never goes back to you bringing something to the table. Here's why it's so important. What happens for a lot of us, what happens for a lot of us, we think, watch, we think, for a lot of you, for a lot of me, I'm bringing some sort of talent. I'm a people person. I can get people in the kingdom. God needs me. God needs my brain power, my intellect, my skill set, my money. He need like, listen, you know, God's old. He's kind of irrelevant. We need to kind of like, you know, spice things up around here. Like God needs the freshness I'm about to bring. And the problem is he doesn't need you. In fact, this is why it's so hard to become a Christian because you need nothing. No, no, listen to me. You need to understand you have nothing. And so many of us are going to cling to, I have something that God needs, and I'm bringing it to the table. And God's like, until you get rid of that thing, there's always going to be something between you and me. Because you think that that thing is going to make you right with me, or it has some leverage with me. But remember, it's, it's all about Jesus. He came, he died, he rose, he ascended, and he's coming back, and you do nothing but receive. Watch. So, so, then, so then the question then is, why then the law? Why do we even have a law? Why? This would have been a whole lot easier if we would just kind of zip through the whole uh, uh, law thing or just got straight with the promise and just, that would have been way easier. So why? And you're asking the same question that, like, Paul's no idiot. He's, he can rejoin. Why then the law? And he's going to say, watch, it was added because of transgressions. And I'm going to explain more about that in a sec. Transgressions just mean like sins. People were like not good people. Shocking, right? Until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made and was put in place through angels by an intermediary. And there's this really tough verse, uh, verse 20. Now, intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. And what he's saying here is not, it's just complicated, but I'll make it simple. He's saying, don't pit Abraham versus Moses. It's not like the promise versus the law. That's not it. Because he says, is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. That's meganoito. That's like the most extreme. If, if you know, the cotton patch gospel would say, hell no. That's, that's right. That's like the extreme version of no, 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 no. The law is not contrary to the promise of God. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. Verse 22, but the scripture 
imprisoned everything under sin. Why? Because if you don't follow it, you're cursed. And you're, you're cursed because you can't do it. So that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. It's by faith. Now, before faith came, we were captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. And then he's going to explain it. Like, okay, maybe you didn't get that way. I'm going to re-explain those two verses like this. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. And he uses this word guardian, which in the Greek is pedagogos, okay? Or pedagogos, or pedagogy. You guys, from, where are my teachers at? Teachers, where are you at? You guys know what that word means. It's like, this is how you train up a child, okay? Here, it's a nerdy word for, or the Greek word for, here's the, the curriculum, here's the basics of understanding of bringing a child to understand learning. And what would happen in this culture is that you would have somebody that would be a slave tutor, if, you know, you kind of were an up and comer, you have a slave tutor in charge of young boys until adulthood, and they weren't allowed to go outside the family house without the slave tutor chaperoning them. They would take everything in. They would, they would have a, a learning, everything would be a learning time. Everything would be like this, you know, a chance to learn. And they would have no exposure outside of it. And so they were, a slave, they were treated like a slave because there was a slave over them. Okay? But when they became of age, they inherited, watch, they inherited their rights as a son. That's why verse 26 is, for in Christ Jesus, through faith, you are all sons of of God. So you're no longer under foster care of the law. You are now free as a son of God. You've been adopted. And if you've never experienced anything to do with foster world, there's like, I've been 3,122 days in foster care and now I'm adopted. And that same sort of relief that brings tears and excitement is exactly what God wants you to feel that you are no longer under a foster system. You're under a sonship or a daughtership. You have connection with the Father. It's beautiful. So watch. Christians focus on Christ's perfection, not our shame. Okay, so, so here's what happens with us. Uh, let me try to explain it this, this way. Uh, so Adrian and I went on a, uh, for my birthday, we went on a family retreat. And um, remember how I talked about Adrian's stress paints and in the middle of her stress painting, you know, she had a, kind of snapped at some point. And I was like, okay, just so I haven't got this email for a free retreat that we can go for five days and get away from it all. And the Battens will take Paxton, who's causing, a lot of, causing you stress. So we're going to get away. All right, so we did. And we went to this camp. We're literally there. We thought we were going to like, you know, a retreat where there'd be like 100 people there and we're just like in the crowd. There were seven families. Okay. There were two licensed professional counselors that would follow you around, taking notes. <laughs> and so I, I was like, man, they must think we're really messed up, All right? So anyway, um, so anyway, so I'm at this camp, and uh, at one point, we had to do this uh, craft as a family. And so, you know, remember, I've got a two-year-old, so uh, the Battens had our baby, who was 11 months, which we were like so great before, but we still had a two-year-old, a five-year-old, and a six-year-old. And we had to do this craft, which required uh, the family taking a bunch of nails and nailing a shape into a board, then taking yarn and then making like an anchor where you'd write like a scripture verse on it, all right? So that's kind of what the plan was. And so taking a two-year-old to nail something, all right? You want to talk about stressful and everybody getting a little bit grouchy. <laughs> so the counselor goes like to Adrian later uh, Looks like dad was a little unhappy today. Did you notice that? What could be causing that? Adrian's like, well, he just has performance things that he's got to get it done. She's like, hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. So then, so then she, she kind of came later and she, so she talked, you know, was talking us through all this stuff. It was, it was incredible. It was an incredible weekend to kind of talk about all of our issues. And, you know, like we had counseling sessions every mealtime as our kids were screaming. It was great. Um, so what would happen, though, at the end of it, we had like this little thing where they took care of our kids. They all showed a movie, and we had like this special dinner just as a couple, and they were having us fill out thank you cards uh, to all the people that donated to make this thing possible. Because I was like, I go, how much do you guys charge? And I was like, ah, 150, 175. I'm like, man, that's a lot of hours that we just got. <laughs> like, yeah, and so licensed professional counselors had a recreation therapy person. It was like, they were all out for, it was seven, it was like 14 couples 14, or sorry, 14 people, seven couples. It was 
like intense, right? And we got all this attention, all this time, and somebody paid for it. At the end of it, at the special dinner, they didn't just hand us a bill and say like, all right, so this is going to cost you, um, you know, $15,000 for all the hours of licensed professional counseling, uh, for the recreation therapy, for the lodging, for all your food, because it was like, I don't know, gourmet, and it was like unending. And I was like, because it had already been paid for. These donors, I didn't even know, paid for it. Watch. And what happens, I think, for a lot of us we don't feel right about accepting that gift. And here's what we do. We feel like we need to feel bad about ourselves. We need to take on some shame. And if I feel bad, and if I feel a little bit blackballed, I gotta pay some penance to sort of let, let God um, see how sorry I am. I need to be, uh, you know, I can't come to church for a while. I can't spend time with God for a while. I need to kind of make it right. And this is where a lot of us say, I, I need to get my life together before I start coming back to church. And that's wrong. Because you're focused on you, which we already know is a train wreck. Everybody here needs counseling. Everybody, including me. But the one who doesn't need counseling is Jesus. He's perfect. And so let me explain why this is important. Remember, why then the law? It came in because of sin. Because here's the truth of, of what happens with us. Relationship minus rules always leads to abuse. Okay, think, about your, think about your marriage for a second. There are rules, right? You have certain rules of how, the way we interact. You can't just do anything because that would be abusive, right? That's abusive. Okay, on the flip side, rules minus relationship leads to rebellion, okay? Just look at your kids. If you just kind of stack on the rules, you stack on the rules, and there's no relationship that says, I love you, I'm proud of you, you're mine, there's a reason why, this is what pleck and pulls do, and this is how we interact, then your kids are going to grow up to just do exactly the opposite of everything you trained them, just in spite of you, because they got, there's no why. They don't feel the love. And so here's, here's this, right? And that's sort of how we all we interact with God. If you thought that God was all about rules and no relationship, then nah. I can do what I want to do. It's not that I don't believe there's a God. I just don't care. But relationship plus rules equals real love, right? That, that's the truth. Now, you're like, but Chris, I thought you said that we couldn't keep the rules. Exactly. And that's why Jesus came. He fulfills the law for you so you understand the relationship aspect, okay? So ethically, we have um, the, the, the law. Remember, the law had ethical create a, a people that was unique ethically, a people that was unique ceremonially or culturally. So what Jesus says, don't worry about cultural. We're going to offend every cultural equally, okay? And then, but what is true, you, your sins, your wickedness still need to be paid for. I got you. So at any moment, you look at Christ and you don't focus on your shame. You focus on what Jesus has done for you. And that's what empowers you to change. Otherwise, you'll be filled up with shame and you'll go, I can't do it. I don't deserve to live. I'm so awful. You, you'd be better off without me. How many of you, you've said that in your marriage? You'd be better off. You said this in a relationship. You would be better off without me. And you might be the very thing that God is using to grow that person closer to Jesus. Okay, uh, let, me, let me try this way. I, I think when I was... Um, in my 20s, I heard this, and it was called the pickup truck gospel. And it essentially went like this. It's like getting saved is like God putting you in the back, and, you know, he picks you up, puts, or you, you know, you, he comes alongside in the pickup truck, asks you if you want to get on, you hop in the back, and he's taking you to heaven. But he leaves the tailgate down just so that you know that you need to get as close to the cab as possible. Because, you know, listen, if there's any, un, if there's any bumps, you could fall out. And so you leave the tail, tailgate down, you could, you could lose your salvation at any moment. And that is what happens with that is you create spiritual abuse. Because what that is is saying, listen, um, it's great that you believe Jesus and all, but it's really your works that keep you in. So I know that Jesus came, he died, he rose, you know, he said he's coming back, but it's you keeping you here. So don't you dare. And, and, and people would say, listen, we got to do that because people would just go astray if we don't control them. People just start doing all sorts of crazy chaotic stuff. Cats sleeping with dogs. It's all going to happen if we don't keep the tailgate down. But the gospel is this. The gospel is you broken, and Jesus pulls up and says, hey, hop in the cab. Let me take you home. And I got you, and I'm locking you in, and you're going nowhere because you're with me. I want to be with you forever. That 
is the gospel. Now, so watch. So take that, take that thought into our, our tribe issues that we all have. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, you got a new identity, have put on Christ. Your identity is, is Jesus, nothing else. And then he's going to say, like, there's a part of you that wants to go back to your old way. And he's going to say, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male and female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. In other words, watch this. Jew nor Greek, there's no longer racial partiality. Okay, okay. There's neither slave nor free. There's no longer SES partiality, socioeconomic status partiality. You can just get rid of that. And then, and then watch, there's no male and female. We've this gender partiality. Listen, to say that in that age is to be like unbelievably relevantly new. Like everyone's like, whoa, you're pushing the envelope, Paul. Male and like women aren't even allowed to testify in court. Stop saying, like, let, let's just kind of, let's keep it among men. But he doesn't do that. Male and female, there's no partiality. Jesus saves, not based on race, not based on socioeconomic status, and not even based on gender. Okay, because, look at this, Christians focus on Christ's family, not our tribe. And, and let me just explain this real quick. Um, when I, I lived in um, Tokyo for a couple years when I was uh, in sixth and seventh grade, all right? And so um, in Tokyo, there's a word for uh, white people, all right? And that's gaijin, all right? And, and they'd walk around and be like, gaijin, gaijin. In general, as anybody was a foreigner, but felt like it was just me. All right, so, and what would happen is they would, they would pull down their eye, the other kids on the, on the subway, Hold on their eye, and they're like, hey, round eye. And they go, gaijing, gaijing. And they thought it was hysterical, and they all laugh. And uh, you know what it did for me? I'm like, oh, yeah? And I, I, I had a, a 1988 okay, USA Olympic jacket, bright white. It was like members only. You guys remember the like, snaps together? Beautiful. All right. And then it had huge letters in red, USA, okay? And I would put that thing on. It didn't matter if it was 80 degrees, 90 degrees. I'm wearing my members only USA jacket and I'd roll down the subway being like, American. <laughs> and, and what happened, I realized the ugly American thing was accentualized, accentualized, accentualized? Accentuated, thank you. Accentuated by, by uh, the amount of like, the more that they kind of like looked at me and I felt different, the more I felt like I had to be different. Like, oh yeah, oh yeah, okay. American, and uh, yeah, I am a roundy, all right, and that's okay, and okay, I don't know, last time I checked, World War II, what's up? <laughs> okay, and it went so far, okay, so far, watch, 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 it went so far, there was an um, American woman who was my uh, Japanese history teacher, okay, so this made it even more awkward, she gave up her American citizenship and became Japanese, and I about lost my mind, I was like, how dare you? betray. Like, this is the greatest country on the planet. I don't know if you noticed my USA jacket, but we just killed everybody in the Olympics, okay? All right? So don't you dare give up your, like, what is wrong with you? I, I, because to me, that was the ultimate identity, right? How could you do that? Now watch, watch. What happens in churches today, people are so stuck on identity, are we not? Like, the music isn't my, isn't my culture. Whoa. Oh, everyone's gonna get a little quiet now. Okay, and what happens, you don't, you don't do community, you don't do family, like I do family. So you got to understand there's a way to do this. And what Jesus says, he equally offends everybody everywhere by saying, listen, I'm eradicating this thing of culture being supreme. I'm eradicating this thing of gender being the thing. I'm eradicating this thing of socioeconomic status. I pay the bill so I get God's will. You know what I mean? Like, well, that was fun. Because there's this reality that that's sort of how we think. And so I want you to kind of, as you wrap your head around that, it's about Christ. And that's why we do communion. Because I want you to focus on who you belong to. Because this is a reality in this deep thing inside you that, that Jesus, the night before he was betrayed, he wanted to make sure we had wrapped our head around this. He broke bread, gave it to the disciples, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Your identity is me not your performance, not your shame, and not your tribe. And then he took the cup, wood for wine, glass for grape juice. This is my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. 
his performance on the cross, he fulfills the law, then takes our place. His immutability becomes mutable for a moment as he's on the cross and the wrath of God falls on Jesus when it should have fallen on me. And so this morning, if you're not a Christian, if, if there's never been a point in which you've taken your trust from your performance or maybe your shame <clears throat> or maybe your tribe and you said, I'm Catholic, I'm good. If you've, never, if you've never taken it from your denominational corporate setting to a relationship with Jesus, um, this morning, uh, we're going to bring our prayer team up. If you guys want to come up. Our prayer team is going to come up, and I would love for you to say, listen, um, my identity is, and I've been trying to be a good person. <laughs> you can never be good enough. My identity is in my, I grew up, Baptist, Catholic, a name of denomination, doesn't even matter. You grew up Bible church. I grew up Wells Branch. Don't matter. I want you to come up and say, listen, my identity has been in a, a tribe and not in a, a real personal relationship with Jesus, which then eat, ultimately makes me part of the family of God. Or maybe you, you are a Christian, but somehow in life, it somehow became more about performance or your shame or your tribe. You don't even know how it happened. And would you ask God to just transform? Would you come up and just be vulnerable with some people and say, I confess that and I want to repent of that. Would you pray over me? Pray the gospel that he came, he died, he rose, he said he's coming back over my life because I'm having trouble believing. And then your heart will be focused on him and not on anything else. In my heart that this morning that somebody here maybe for the first time would come to faith in Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, um, I love you. Worship you. I'm asking that you would do even more than we could ever hope for or ask. I'm praying that today we'd be identified with you on the cross. We'd see our shame nailed there. Instead of our performance, we'd see your righteousness and what you did and the promise that you have for us that the Holy Spirit would come by faith and not even faith that we have the ability to conjure up, the one that you've gifted us. And God, you would work through us and in us and that we would say no to all um, earthly alliances. We'd say, Jesus, you're my first priority. You're my first relationship. You come before everything else and it would transform our lives. Jesus, help us. And as we move into time of prayer and confession, would that just be at the, on our lips? And as we do take communion this morning, that would be our heart to remember what you, Jesus, did for us on that cross. We love you, Lord. So, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.